Um, so today's talk, as Anthony said, is looking at basic soft tissue surgical principles. Um, really what we're going to do is, is look at the whole package, not just the picking up the scalpel blade. So firstly, let's, let's just clarify what soft tissue is relating to. And fundamentally, that's everything in the body except for the bone work. So we're talking about muscle, skin, fat, tendons, ligaments, eyes, ears, and the list goes on. And it will make up the vast majority of work that you see in first opinion practice in the clinic. And it's really important to recognize right from the start that surgery is more than just picking up a scalpel blade. Um, and in actual fact, a lot of the hard work is done well before the animal gets to the theater. In this presentation, we're going to kind of outline all the things that you need to consider, specifically the Holstead's principles of surgery, but everything on the way through. So the very first step to be talking about is, is the planning phase. So in planning for a surgical procedure, you need to know what surgery you're going to be performing, why you're performing it. Um, if you're doing a tumor excision, you need to be knowing about margins that you're taking and how you intend to do it and how you intend to close that hole once you've made it. And fundamentally, it's really, really important with all surgeries that you have a plan when you go in and then you should have at least one backup plan if and when that plan fails on you. So in your planning phase, you need to be taking good samples, analyzing them at a good lab, and be happy that the results are matching the clinical signs and that you're getting repeatably confident results. If you're unsure of your lab, then you need to be looking around and choosing another lab. If you're dealing with things like cancer removal, um, then stage it appropriately. Image diagnostically. Now that's underlined because it's incredibly common to see very poor radiographs with quite a lot of interpretation on what is actually a non-diagnostic image. If you're doing ultrasound, make sure that the person who's doing the ultrasonography is experienced, has done plenty of ultrasound before, and is interpreting it confidently and accurately. When it comes to the surgery, you need to be thinking about anatomy. You need to know the major local structures. And one of my favorite ways of, of going forward with complex surgery is to imagine the absolute worst case scenario. What's the worst possible thing that could happen in this surgical procedure? And once I've thought about that, worked out how I would deal with it and cope with it, everything else on the day is a bonus if that doesn't happen. So you've got to ensure you're also the right person for the surgery and that that animal is, you are the best person to do that surgery for that animal. And if you aren't or you're not 100% confident, making sure you've got somebody in the area that can back you up or scrub in to give you an extra pair of hands is really, really beneficial. Emergency procedures is on that list. Now, you can't always plan for an emergency procedure and undoubtedly they're going to turn up when you're really busy, when you're short-staffed, they're in the middle of the night, they're on the weekend, they're always at an inconvenient time. But if you're just starting out, having a good think through the most common surgical emergencies that you're going to see and coming up with a basic protocol in your mind of how you would like things to progress is a really useful tip. And when you actually get that cesarean or that GDV walk through the door, Rather than falling back into absolute panic mode, I don't know what to do now, you can fall into that protocol and start your, start your actual process confidently. Um, good evening, everyone. I think um, I'll pick up now with um, the preoperative preparation. Um, and for many of us, I think we make the mistake that we, we seem to for, forget the preoperative preparation as as an important part of all soft tissue surgery. Um, I think whenever we're planning a, a mass cell removal maybe that's in a difficult place that may require advancement flaps or, or particularly if we're planning some form of, of intra-abdominal surgery, um, we, we seem to often forget that the, the part where we pick up the scalpel blade is actually a, a long way down the line. And preoperative preparation is, is really, really important. Um, and for me, all surgical procedures start from the day it's booked. 
And that's because that's the day that you should be thinking about the plan that Ed has, has just mentioned. But it's also the time with which the owner becomes worried. So from the moment that surgery is booked, I'm having an adrenal gland out, or I'm having a liver lobectomy, or my mast cell from the mammary gland is being removed. That's the moment the owner starts worrying. So the procedure starts from the dates booked for the owner. And in your head, I think the same should happen. Um, Preoperative fasting is something which I think we see a, a lot of varying advice. Um, I work across a series of practices, and you'll see a, a large difference in, in the advice that people will give. Um, it's always important to remember that preoperative fasting should be less than 12 hours. Um, I think we all still see those clients who feed their dogs once a day, and I'm sure we're all advising them to feed twice a day. Um, but starving them from 6 o'clock the night before a surgery is really not the right way forward. So um, as a general rule, preoperative fasting should be less than 12 hours. Um, the main reason for that is that beyond 12 hours, you're obviously going to get enterocyte death. And particular problem, as discussed in Murr, was the glutamine starvation. So in terms of your... Your, your anesthetic recovery, the quality of the patient that you have, particularly if you're doing certain types of surgery, a period of preoperative fasting greater than 12 hours can actually materially increase the risk. Um, as a general rule, I tend to say no food from midnight, um, and that's for a morning procedure. Obviously, if there are any procedures which are going to be taking place later on in the day, um, then I'll often ask them to be fed early morning, maybe 3, 4, 5 a.m., um, which most clients are more than willing to do. Um, it's worth just touching upon neonates, obviously. Again, this is something that we, we will see neonates coming in starved or they've not eaten since sort of 6 o'clock last night for their surgery. Um, Preoperative fasting in neonates is really not the way forward. They should be fed and they should be, be well maintained and well, well nutritioned when they come in for any surgery. Um, and you will see surgery in these younger animals, and, and most of these surgeries are, are often difficult ones or, or particularly challenging ones because obviously for them to have the need for surgery at that age, it often is a, a higher risk procedure. Um, and we will touch upon this later, but as soon as, as they are awake enough, um, because of that glutamine starvation and that enterocyte death, they need to be fed on recovery. So really important to get that preoperative fasting period correct. Um, admissions. Now, this is something that probably um, every vet does slightly different. Um, I know certainly from Ed's perspective, um, his, his caseload is now so great that quite often he won't do the admission himself, um, but will always see the patient a few, you know, within a few days of the surgery. Um, as a general rule, I do like to do my own admissions, but that is... Um, amended based upon the type of procedure, particularly if they're a routine. Um, I do think it's important often to put a face to a name to make sure that you've had a chat with the owners and make sure they're happy and comfortable. But a lot of the admission criteria could be done by um, the array of well-qualified nurses that are now working within the profession. Um, at admission, you obviously need to take a full clinical history, make sure that, you know, in the three days since it was seen, it's not vomiting or it's not got diarrhea. Um, and for a lot of these animals, for example, and again, if we go back to a mast cell tumor, maybe animals that have been on pyroton or prednisolone pre-surgery, pre um, that they are, you know, we've got an idea of when they last had their medication and we're making sure that we get those medications in the pre-meds and, and induction rights. Um, clinical examination is always really important. Um, nothing worse than um, missing the other mast cell or missing the other lump. Um, and if you've got a lump that you've, you know, as Ed said, you made plan A to remove this one centimetre mass on the right flank that is now three centimetres, then you really need to know about that before the animal's on the surgical table. Um, all animals should be weighed on the morning of the surgery. Um, even if they've been weighed the day before, they need to be weighed again. And um, this is really important to lead fluid therapy. It's also really important to lead um, any post-operative complications or management of post-operative complications. Um, temperature, again, very, very important to take. Um, as you know, vast majority of risk of hypothermia during general anesthesia. 